You're listening to the KSO Show. One more solo show this week with me, Derek Young, as your host and doing everything else on it as well. Before, you know, the next one you'll hear from us is our game preview, where it'll be me, myself, Derek Young. Also, I'll be joined by likely Grant Flanders of KSO as well, and Drew Galloway as we preview the Kansas State and Oklahoma State and give, give our picks, predictions, keys, standouts, and everything of that sort. But before we get to that I'm here to discuss what we heard from both the offensive coordinator, Courtney Messingham, and the defensive coordinator, Joe Klanerman, at Thursday's press conference. They speak to us every Thursday. This was no different. Courtney Messingham's always first in the lineup. And, you know, I asked a question, and it's, it was good to get some clarity. Are we going to see the same kind of quarterback shuffle? Are they going to approach the quarterback position the same way that they did against Nevada? That was Will Howard getting the first couple possessions, then Jaron Lewis getting a couple, and then Will Howard smooth sailing for the rest of the game. It actually turned out the way that those possessions were divided and how they fell in you know the couple possession, couple possession kind of thing. Will Howard got that first quarter. Jaron Lewis got the second quarter. Will Howard took the entire second half. And Courtney Messingham was, you know, not really coy, not really shy, not really, um, you know, in a mood to necessarily hide his plan. He says that he expects to run out the same approach to have the same plan. I think that's something that they've discussed. Chris Kleiman was a little bit more covered and hidden about what the approach would be. Courtney Messingham wasn't, said we will, that we would see Jaron Lewis once again in this one against Oklahoma State in the Big 12 opener in Stillwater. Um, do I believe him? I, I, a little bit less than last week, if you if you're if we're being completely honest. Just because this is a little bit different, this is Big Twelve football, and I do think that if we get to a point where, I guess I'm saying I think this one will be much more game flow dependent. I think they're going in with an expectation that they're not afraid to play Jaron Lewis, and they could do it at the same time that they did last week. However, last week I think they were very convictive and went in with a clearly um, eloquent plan that was, you know, communicated to those quarterbacks. I don't think we got that this week, the reading between the lines. I, I don't, I don't know that there was, that they were so plainly told Will Howard, you're, you're going to get the first few possessions and then Jaron Lewis, you're going to get the next few. I, I, I read between the lines, just kind of getting the, inner, the, the reactions from everyone when we asked those types of questions this week, it didn't seem like that was the case. Now I do think that they're preparing journalists to, as if you would play as if it would be similar to last week. So if everything falls the same way as it was did last week, I think we will see journalists, but let's say, but I, I just think it's going to be more game flow dependent. Let's say Will Howard's hot. It's not like, well, we told Jaron Lewis we were going to do this. So we got to do that. I don't think that they put themselves in that corner, I think Jaron Lewis could play, but if Will Howard's hot, Kansas State just goes down there, scores two touchdowns in the first quarter. He's got it going through the air a little bit because let's be honest, he kind of did against Oklahoma State last week or last year. It was a really good, well uh, called game by Courtney Messingham. He had the off, he had the QB run game going too. He ran for over 120 yards against the Cowboys at home in Manhattan last season. I think it's possible that he really has it going on then they'll refrain from going to Jaron Lewis. That's not to say he will have it going on. He's had his struggles throughout his career in a lot of different games. So it actually might be more likely than not he doesn't have it going on. And then I do think you could see Jaron Lewis. The one question I have, and obviously we didn't get that asked when we spoke to Courtney Messingham. Obviously there's a few more things to go over at this point, although it wasn't really an entirely informative session with, with the Kansas State's offensive coordinator. But what, what I kind of would want to know is what happens if Kansas State is the one that drops a couple scores in that first quarter? What if they're the ones that are down 14 nothing? Like I said, neither team is really well equipped. To, oh, and I've said it in previous podcasts. Neither team is really well equipped to play from behind. Because when you play from behind, you do have to rely on your passing game a little bit more. Neither one of those teams wants to do that. If Kansas State's forced to do that, is Will Howard the guy? I mean, they'll probably give him a shot, but I wonder if you become a little bit more willing or eager or convinced or, you know, encouraged or, or a little bit more confident in Jaron Lewis, if that were the case, because we have, we, you know, Jaron Lewis has not been trusted to do much with the offense. Even when he played last week, 
three pass attempts, six yards in the second quarter. Um, not a big sample size. We don't know what he's got. We don't know what he does yet. Um, when the, when the, the bright lights are on and, and, you know, it's his chance. But what we have been told, very live arm. Um, maybe the most armed town in the room. I, I don't disagree. His high school tape kind of certainly indicated that, and he was probably the best arm of the quarterback prospects that they've chased or, or I guess that they've landed. So it makes sense that that would be the description for him. He can certainly sling it. Um, you wonder if it's the decision-making that holds him back um, a complete grasp or an understanding of what they want him to do and how to maneuver and, and maybe make the right checks and stuff of that elk. I mean, well, and that, and that probably brings us to our next point. While I do think maybe Jaron Lewis is that guy, if you get down a couple of scores and Skylar can't, and if it's true that Skylar Townsend can't go, then, then I, then I wonder if it's Jaron Lewis, obviously, but going to the next point, I just touched on it a little bit in terms of getting into the right play. I think that might be where a lot of the lack of trust might be with Jaron Lewis. I don't think that we, I can't say for sure that's what we saw, you know, last week in the second quarter when he played. We we can't tell what's being checked and what's not. Because I didn't know that what Cordy Messingham revealed on Thursday, and that's Will Howard probably made 15, 20 different checks in that ball game last week. I didn't know that. I knew he made some. You can tell when you're making a different play at the line of scrimmage or something of that nature. That many didn't know it, and it said like every single one was the right decision. And it was actually some of those were the pass plays. They called more than the 13 or 14 pass plays that they ran. Um, but Will Howard checked him into runs, and it was the right decision because he, he looked at the box, he looked at the defensive formation, understood that Nevada wasn't defending the run all that well. It really got the Kansas State's offensive line was really leaning on them. It was what was working. So, you know, smart by him. That's what he went with. You'd like you like that he's able to manage the game in that way. So I thought that was another large takeaway that we received from uh, Courtney Messingham. Defensively, uh, we spoke with Joe Klanerman. You know, we're, we're not going to have Khalid Duke for the rest of the season. Kansas State's without him. He has after he suffered a pretty significant injury against Nevada. It's, and it's as we thought, the, you know, the first answer, the main answer will be Nate Matlack in that role. But he, Khalid Duke was doing a lot of different things, right? He, he was starting to become a well-rounded football player. He was very impactful. He was a playmaker for the Wildcats, even in the, the three games. And you could tell that he took a step forward, a dramatic step forward, if we're being honest, from last year to this year. Uh, he was playing some of the best football of his career, and I don't think that can be argued. But just because he was doing multiple different things, it's not just going to be Nate Latlack, Let Nate Matlack, sorry, that replaces him. We're also going to see the likes of Ryan Hennington and Wayne Jones because Khalid Duke was also playing a little bit of linebacker. So uh, maybe we see a little bit more Wayne Jones, a little bit more Ryan Hennington, uh, Spencer Trussell, another defensive end that'll spell him as well. Um, that that's how just how they're going to have to respond to him. Um, it's not ideal, but obviously I will say they do have some depth there. It would, you'd rather have Khalid Duke than not, don't get me wrong. But they do have the depth there to probably be more apt to absorb that kind of injury without as much drop-off than maybe they would in the past, and, and that's certainly a good sign um, for them. Uh, like I said, not a completely informative session um, they're weary of how Spencer Sanders can extend the play. Um, obviously, he is a walking turnover as well, a dis sometimes a disaster of a decision maker, but he is athletic. He is explosive with his legs, and he is someone that can turn it – heck, he can turn a three-yard loss into a 30-yard gain. He does have that potential. He does have that ability in his arsenal that you still have to worry about him. So that is something to keep in mind as well. Um, a lot of talk on the penalty last week, but Joe Clarence still moving forward. And, uh, you know, I'd rather, you know, break an NCAA record, lead the NCAA in fun. He's still of that mindset. Um, he's not completely against it as long as they're celebrating as a team. And they certainly were in that case. Um, he's also mindful that they're going to be playing in a raucous environment. This is going to be a full house in T. Boone Pickens Stadium in Stillwater. They didn't have these kinds of environments to play in last year. Um, he's actually looking forward to it. He's This is what makes college football college football. It's why we love it so much. Um, it's fun to play in these kinds of environments. It's a little bit of me against the world, us against the world type attitude that you have to have. But at the end of the day, he wants his guys so locked in 
that it doesn't matter where they're playing in. They could be playing in hell, he said. Uh, I'm quoting him. We could be playing in hell, but it doesn't matter because we're still we're so focused. That's what Joe Clinterman wants from his club. Again, not the most informative sessions with the coordinators this week, but I hope you did learn a little bit about the Wildcats in the upcoming matchup against Oklahoma State. A lot of ramifications, a lot of implications for this one. Um, I wouldn't call it a must win, maybe, but it is a swing game. I, I call it the Stanford game a must, a swing game if you're talking bowl game. I And obviously Kansas State won. I called the Nevada game a swing game if you're kind of thinking, hey, let's let's get at least eight wins this year. And obviously Kansas State won. So you've built the resume and got off to that 3 know start that really puts eight wins on the table. I think a win against Oklahoma State and Stillwater on Saturday, that's another swing game that I think could put 10 wins on the table. You beat Oklahoma State. There's a lot of other teams in this league you, you can beat, and it takes away a little bit of that margin for error that you might need going into the gauntlet, which you know, I called this entire six-game stretch a gauntlet, and they're 3-0 to get 4-0. and There's only two, two games left in this gauntlet before you probably have that trap came in Texas Tech after it, of course, but, then I, but you need that margin for error, a little breathing room before you get to Oklahoma and before you get to or Oklahoma home and Iowa State at home. So this is the road game that really could tip the scales. And and if you get the win to a point where you can start dreaming about a special season, um, no doubt about it, Cats already 25 in the AP poll. Uh, we're going to finish this up. You've been listening to the KSO Show. The next one will be the game preview, where I hope to be joined by Drew Galloway and Grant Flanders, also of KSO. And we'll give our preview of the Kansas State-Oklahoma State battle in Stillwater, full game preview, give you our picks our key players our keys in general it'll be a good listen as uh and we'll probably be filming that we'll already be in oklahoma or filming it when we record that i'm Derek young you've been listening to the kso show and tell your friends <laughs>